All right, so um, thanks for having me in today, guys. It's kind of neat to be able to do a digital webinar like this or a lunch and learn, so to speak. And uh, like I said, I'm pretty excited to be presenting to the city of Vancouver. Um, I grew up there. Uh, I definitely have a fond, fond memories of, of North Van and, and your ecosystem. So I'm not just coming in as a, as a Calgarian in minus 30 trying to tell you guys how you should operate your, your ecosystem. I'm, I'm originally from that area. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Rob Avis. I'm a mechanical engineer. I originally started off in the oil and gas industry as a petroleum engineer, uh, building pipelines and oil and gas facilities, and left that role after uh, I, I received a three-minute video talking about permaculture, actually, which completely changed my mind about how humans should coexist on this planet. And uh, being an engineer, after watching that video and looking at what this gentleman, Jeff Lawton, had done um, with his life, uh, made me realize that I wanted to be part of the making things better as opposed to making things worse. And so I, I, we quit our jobs, my wife and I, Michelle, who's also a mechanical engineer and was also working in the oil and gas industry. And we traveled the world for about three years. And we did this because we wanted to try and understand whether the the discourse around humans, which we're going to get into today in this presentation, um, was true. And the discourse that we were getting in Calgary was that humans could not repower the world. Um, given that we were energy focused, we wanted to understand if there was a way um, to move away from petroleum. And uh, everybody was telling us that it was not feasible. So we left our jobs um, to try and pursue other careers so that we could put our life energy to productive use recognizing that we all have about 600,000 hours and that we'd burned through about a third of them. So we traveled to Denmark to study renewable energy for six months. We spent six months in Australia understanding regenerative agriculture. We traveled right through the United States and Mexico in order to um, also understand renewable energy and regenerative agriculture. And everywhere we went, we, we got a different message about how humanity could and should be operating. And uh, Denmark was especially interesting because what we recognized was that repowering the world was actually the least of our challenges. And I know that sounds like a very strange thing to say given the magnitude of our energy infrastructure. But while we were in North America talking about how renewable energy was not possible, they were uh, well on their way to becoming net positive in their production of renewable energy due to the uh, constraints that they had in the 1970s um, from the oil embargo. Um, Denmark had the choice to either go nuclear or figure out how to produce wind turbines, which had never been done before at that scale, in order to repower their country. So we felt pretty confident as engineers that we could repower the world, but we started to kind of dig into some other liabilities, which we're going to get into today, specifically around food. And we did not come up with such rosy answers around the food system. Not in the fact that there's not solutions, but just the scale of the problem is so massive that and, and really not being talked about very much, um, not in the ways that it needs to be. So we've since had a couple of kids and that picture was taken in our backyard where we're trying to demonstrate a lot of these uh, um, ideas on a microcosm which can be scaled up to a macrocosm which we're going to talk about a little bit today. So the core tenet of permaculture, and I'll, I'll be the first to admit, um, pretty much even, even my colleagues who are teaching permaculture, I think sometimes miss the breadth of uh, this design system. And it does tend to get relegated to urban gardening and you know, regenerative farming. And uh, it couldn't be further from the truth. These are one component of a, a very large system. And one of the things that I've realized over the last decade in teaching and consulting on permaculture is that as an engineer in uh, mechanical engineering school, we, we spent a long time talking about entropy. And uh, your eyes are probably glazing over because you've got another, you've got an engineer talking to you about some strange word called entropy that you've either heard of or, or and if you have heard of, you don't understand what it means because it's a very esoteric concept or you've never heard of the word. And so entropy is basically, basically the measure of disorder. And permaculture directly addresses entropy, and we're going to get the sense of that here in a second. And this slide really kind of addresses it. Um, entropy is essentially the measure of disorder within any system uh, that is improperly designed, essentially. And so in nature, there is no worker pollution. Worker pollution is, um, it doesn't exist. In fact, when we create work in nature, we end up creating pollution. 
Um, and so the other way of thinking about that is that when the needs of a system are not met from within, we create work and pollution. And so permaculture's primary aim is the creation of human ecosystems that allow things to thrive by copying nature. And ultimately you can take one step further from that and say that we're creating human ecosystems that actually move entropy in the other direction. So climate change, if we had to characterize it in one word, is actually just human induced entropy within our ecosystems. The dead zones, another form of entropy. And these are all just waste products that have not been put to productive use. And so they're creating chaos within the systems that we all depend upon. And so permaculture at its core is a design system that aims to create ecosystems for humans to exist in that allows all the living things on earth to coexist with us, which I would argue has not been our development pattern up until now. So if, if you look at the definition of engineering, just as one example of um, the overall human development pattern, the definition of engineering is, is the manipulation of matter to the benefit of humankind. Now, if I had to create a definition for ecological engineering, which would be uh, basically permaculture, it would be the manipulation of matter to the benefit of humankind and all living things on earth. And so it's a, it's a paradigm shift. It's recognizing that we're actually very self-interested individuals and self-interest is not the issue. It's that we've been self-interested through the lens of ignorance recognizing or not recognizing that our livelihood, our health, our survival even, which David Suzuki is now questioning in the next couple of decades as a species, is highly dependent on the ecosystems around us. And, and so uh, it's a very self-interested approach to creating design that recognizes that it's not a matter of how much it costs to fix climate change, or the dead zones or any of these other issues. It's a matter of whether we want to be in relation on this planet with everything else around us. That's really the gravity of the situation that we're dealing with. So to kind of frame the conversation today in terms that you guys are probably dealing with on a regular basis, or if it's not you, you um, specifically, people within your departments are, are addressing, is the energy footprint of, the, of a typical urbanite. And in some situations, these categories are not necessarily urbanites. And I know these numbers are gonna be a little different from Vancouver, because you don't get to minus 30. And I also recognize that in some of the stuff I'm talking about, you guys are rapidly moving towards a natural gas-free city, which is incredible. However, I hope to shed some light on, in spite of the fact that Vancouver going to natural gas-free, that there is embodied natural gas in everything that we do as a species and a lot of the uh, in, these embodiments are invisible to us and so as planners and leaders and, and city builders we have to be uh, cognizant of these invisible uh, energy requirements in order to, for us to be able to create cities that kind of if we want to to use permaculture as a framework we need to be able to quantify these things so these numbers are based on, and I'll, I'll go through them um, and kind of tell you where I've got them from, and we can talk a little bit more at the end about the specifics of these numbers if you guys are interested. But I wanted to create some energy literacy uh, before I talk about how we solve these energy issues. And so what I did was I calculated the amount of energy in gigajoules per person per year required. And some of these numbers are specifically from Alberta and some of them are just North America in general. Um, and so there will be slightly different numbers for the city of Vancouver, which we could actually go and calculate if we chose to. I'm sure that you guys have all this data. And so I chose the gigajoule number because it's actually the right scale to be looking at when we look at looking at kilowatt hours or any other kind of energy metric, which, which people are generally bombarded with. There's all these different ways of measuring energy, liters of gasoline, kilowatt hours, BTUs, gigajoules. It gets really confusing. And so if we're actually gonna plot a course, we have to set some constraints on the front end and what a better way to set constraints than to understand the liabilities that we currently um, exist or, or um, liabilities that we're creating as, as humans existing on this planet, specifically North Americans. So some of these numbers you'll be familiar with. To drive our cars, on average about 13,000 kilometers a year, and this is gonna depend on the city that you live in, is about 42 gigajoules of energy. And just to kind of wrap your head around a gigajoule, one gigajoule is 277 kilowatt hours, and one kilowatt hour would take 10 Olympians, 10 hours at full capacity to generate. So your MacBook, basically, or whatever laptop computer you're using, would literally need to have uh, an Olympian on a bike using both their arms and their legs to be able to operate that lap laptop in real time. 
So we're all basically existing with an enormous number of energy slaves, around 140 people. If we were back in Roman times, we'd all need about 140 people you know, on, these, on these fan bikes uh, operating 24-7 in order for us to live our existence. And that's what these numbers are representing. We need about 18 gigajoules per person per year in Alberta to heat a house, about 10 gigajoules per person per year to electrify a house, about 0.6 gigajoules to provide our domestic hot water so we can shower and wash dishes, 0.6 gigajoules in the use of our sewage treatment plant, um, if we add up all the energy, 0.07 to provide potable water to our houses, and that big ugly 55 is the amount of energy that we need to fuel a human. And so it turns out that every calorie of food in our current industrial food paradigm takes 10 to 20 calories of hydrocarbons to produce. And um, I've, I've known that stat for a decade, but I never actually converted it over to gigajoules. And so I'm currently at SATE right now. I'm the net, net zero uh, carbon principal building investigator for a living building challenge and a net zero carbon house which tends to be the focus in sustainability circles. We talk a lot about our buildings and how much energy we use from an electricity perspective, but one of these invisible kind of energy numbers that kind of just gets put by the wayside because it's so massive is food. Now, I just told you that permaculture is more than just growing food in urban spaces and regenerative agriculture. Permaculture aims to deal with all of these liabilities simultaneously by understanding the needs and yields or the inputs and outputs of each of these different categories and how they can essentially collaborate to deflate or, or reduce them from liabilities into opportunities or assets. And so I would argue that when the needs of a system are not met from within, in other words, where our food comes from, where our gasoline comes from, where our electricity comes from, where our space heating comes from, where our water and sewage is treated, that's where liabilities start to form. And they, they, as we get into very large systems like the city of Vancouver, the city of Calgary, Edmonton, those liabilities magnify very rapidly. And so uh, designing with permaculture in mind is, is kind of moving in a reverse um, from a scale perspective and looking at things through the lens of decentralization to minimize transport and to try and meet more of the needs of the system from within the system. And so mapping out all of these energy flows is super crucial. So I'm going to talk about a couple of other key liabilities that a lot of people aren't aware of. And, and then I'll talk about some that you probably are aware of. Just touch on them briefly because I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about liabilities. But when we're talking about city building and future sustainability and even allowing humans to continue to coexist on the planet, very few people are talking about this. Phosphorus is one of the most important minerals that we add to the industrial agricultural process. It's not necessarily needed if we're farming in ecological and regenerative ways because phosphorus is on the periodic table and can be cycled indefinitely when we work with the right fungal pathways. But in the current paradigm, we will literally start to decline in grain production. In fact, grain production globally peaked in 1986 per capita and it's gone down ever since. And that's a combination of population force as well as diminishing returns on our grain fields. So we are going to come up against hard limits and we're not talking a lot of time here, like 13 years with the given reserves. And when we look at things like the fact that the United States and China have both banned the export of phosphorus, the people that know are already starting to uh, pivot in this area. And so food is going to get very expensive if we can't be putting phosphorus onto our crops using the existing agricultural paradigm. And there are some shifts out there, but, but there aren't very many. And I would argue that without industrial agriculture in its current form, cities can't, co can't exist. There's just no possible way that we can feed in, in Calgary, for example, 1.2 million people unless we have an enormous amount of land dedicated to feeding them in the current paradigm. And we'll talk a little bit about how that could shift down the road. Uh, but this is going to create a hard constraint. If you look up peak phosphorus, you'll find similar, similar data. Peak natural gas and oil, a lot of people don't realize this unless they're directly involved with farming. But coming back to that 10 calories in to one calorie out, in the 1940s, we were, as a species, producing about three, two to three calories of food out for one calorie of energy in. And of course, that's now reversed. So it's 10 calories in for one calorie out. So if we were all coyotes running around trying to harvest our own food, we would starve to death because we would be consuming more of our fat than, than we were actually getting in 
return calories. Well, I think it's amazing that, that Vancouver is going natural gas free for its space heating. The natural gas that's consumed in the Haber process to produce nitrogen based fertilizers is absolutely astronomical. Depending on the crop that you're trying to grow will depend on the amount of na uh, nitrogen that gets uh, put on these crops. And the nitrogen and phosphorus, which are mostly water soluble, are the reasons that we're ending up with our dead zones. Because the majority of these fertilizers don't actually end up in the crops. Because I would argue that most agriculture is ostensibly just uh, a form of hydroponics. And so whatever the plants don't take up shortly after it's being applied to the field ends up in our rivers and streams, which ends up in our deltas and estuaries, which create dead zones. What's really important to know about this is that a lot of the, and depending on the authors that you read, a lot of the hype around tight shale gas and tight oil, especially in the circles in Calgary, we, a lot of geologists talk about how much fuel there is in the ground still and all this technology and how it's opened up these reserves. However, there is a growing number of geologists and pundits basically that have come and said, you know, this is a, a lot of smoke and mirrors. And the thing is, is that if the pundits are even re remotely close, um, civilization hangs in the thread. And so it's worth understanding from a risk mitigation perspective, what the probability of the resources being lower than are currently being projected and what the reasons might be for the companies that are currently exploiting these shale resources, why they might be interested in reporting larger numbers. And basically it comes down to a reserves and a balance sheet situation. And so I would argue that the resource is too important to trust just to for-profit company balance sheet without a little bit more rigor, namely because of the amount of energy required to produce our food. And so we need to find ways that are closer to our, our resource, uh, basically where we're consuming our food to, to try and meet those needs so that we can move back to a net positive caloric balance. Because again, our cities and our civilization and, and people that depend on food, which is most of us, depend on this. So there's a couple of resources here you guys can follow up with if you choose to, to understand this liability a little bit more. Um, one, thing I'll, one more thing I'll say is that shale resources, which is not often talked about in the public, are hyperbolic in nature, which means that they come on really quick and the decline curves are really quick on the back end. So if there is in fact a shale oil or shale gas bubble, um, as some of these pundits are proposing, in other words, the, the financial resources to exploit these resources disappear, the uh, declines on the other side are catastrophic. Um, and will have cascading effects in the price of food and availability of food. So it's something, another risk to kind of keep in mind. So other equally large liabilities include, um, and I'm, these are the ones I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, uh, biodiversity loss and extinction, dead zones, ocean acidification, soil erosion. Just an inter interesting fact, every ton of grain that's produced right now globally requires seven metric tons of soil in soil erosion which is another reason that our dead zones are showing up. So again, our need to go outside of cities to feed ourselves is causing this huge externality that's, that's causing a lot of these issues. And I would argue that most of these issues are the direct result of industrial agriculture. There's a huge push right now to reduce carbon in our transport and our heating fuels. But another kind of not unknown fact or not very well-known fact by a professor named Dr. Rattan Lal talks about how uh, agriculture has, has put out more carbon by a, a factor of two over all fossil fuels burnt from the beginning of time. So the real elephant in the room is how we eat, not how we drive and not how we heat. Those are important issues, but um, it's, it's how we uh, supply all of, our, all of our needs. We have to look at them all simultaneously because they are all connected. So are humans inherently destructive? And this is the statement that you've all probably thought about, but have never put words to it. And I would argue that humans are not inherently destructive. We have the potential to be just as positive as we are negative. And the missing link is, uh, used to be knowledge. Um, in fact, when, when the Younger Dryas came around and we decided we had to start propagating our own food, we noticed a feedback loop in deforesting, plowing, and desertifying. When we did that, we produced um, larger crops. The desertification was a kind of a lag measure. It took a long time to realize, and because human lifespans were so short back then, we didn't really we weren't able to recognize the pattern. However, I would argue that we're still 
deforesting, plowing and desertifying 12,000 years later. And so now we know what we're doing. We have the knowledge. Um, we also know better ways to do this. And we know how to solve these problems. And, and we've actually are in this very interesting time in human history to have all this energy available to us for this short window. And we can reverse a lot of these issues if we just understand our place within our ecosystem. And so if the most negative thing on the planet is the nuclear bomb, then what's the most positive? And I don't think we have an answer to that, but my suspicion is that humans working together with a shared ethic that uh, really uh, captures the essence of what it means to be human on this earth, which is that everybody has, to, everybody has to win in this situation. It can't just be humans. Too many ecological services and they're too expensive to replace. And so our human habitat has to fundamentally be built with this understanding from the ground up. And so what are the answers? So de design needs to be bioregional. It needs to have built-in feedback mechanisms. This is probably one of the most valuable things that any design can take on. And so we do a lot of consulting for resilient homes, acreages, and farms. And so one of the things that we've noticed is that when somebody puts a solar array on their roof, they start measuring how much power they're consuming relative to the amount that they're producing. When a rainwater harvesting system gets put on, they'll look at the levels in their rain tank and make decisions about consumption based on feedback. And so a lot of city building has happened at the expense of tight feedback loops, which means that individuals don't really have an understanding of the repercussions of the decisions that they're making on a day-to-day -day basis. So when we build feedback back into the system, because all of a sudden now the gray water in your house is irrigating your food forest or your garden, people make different decisions about the soap that they make. We never have to guilt them into ch changing those decisions because of, you know, poor uh, Burrard Inlet or, or the sewage treatment plant, you know, the local sewage treatment plant. It happens all automatically because now they know that that water is going to make a delicious carrot. And so they'll make decisions about their soap that actually make the carrot more delicious. And ironically, their, their own health actually improves as a result of it because they stop using toxic chemicals on their skin as well. So there's lots of examples of these type feedback loops that can be built into the way that we build habitat. Um, we need to be guided by a shared ethic. So the ethic of permaculture, which is central to the entire design system, it's basically engineering with an ethic that includes all of our living creatures around us, which is care of the planet, care of people. So it's not an environmental movement. We're not trying to guilt people into anything. We know that we have to take care of the people around us and then reinvestment of the surplus from our systems back into those first two things. And so I would argue that humanity is in the midst of having a conversation about ethics right now. And you guys hosted two of our current philosophers globally that are fairly well recognized right now, which is Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris. And I would argue that there's a third philosopher that's missing at that table, which is Bill Mollison, which is the originator of permaculture. Because if you listen to what Peterson and Harris are actually talking about, they're trying to get to this, but they're not quite getting there. They're missing a few points. And they're both brilliant people and they both have very important things to add, but I haven't quite heard what they're talking about articulated in this clearer of a statement. And lastly, we need to take entropy into account. So waste is just an unused resource. We have opportunities to take all of these liabilities and turn them into opportunities. And that's really what makes permaculture different is that it's not the roof, the rain barrel or the solar panel, but the connections between them that count. And that's really what we're focused on is trying to create opportunities and niches to take advantage of these liabilities and upgrade them into opportunities, both business and ecological and societal um, and economic. And so we can, we can look at these through all of those lenses and everybody can, can benefit when we start to uh, understand how to create those, those connections. And ultimately cities that are going to be sustainable in the future with the liabilities we've talked about are going to have to start meeting their needs from within. And so one of those components, as we have addressed on the front end, it's one of the largest liabilities is where does food come from and how are we managing the nutrients that we've ostensibly extracted from um, outside of our cities? I would argue that the only way that a, a vegan diet, which is what everybody's talking about right now, is sustainable is if it comes from the very place that you live and that all the wastes that are a result of that diet are returned back into that ecosystem. Otherwise, a vegan diet is just a form of mining. We really have got to take a full cycle and entropic approach to the way that we look at everything that we do as humans, energy, water, waste, fuel, food, all of the above. So 
one of the ways that we can kind of get this answer is by looking to nature. And this is kind of a biomimetic uh, approach to creating solutions. And so trees are rooted in place and yet they harvest all of their energy and water, are adapted to climate and site, operate pollution free, plus turn waste into resources, provide services and create habitat for others, are comprised um, of integrated systems and they're beautiful. <clears throat> I don't think anybody would deny that Stanley Park is the, one of the gems in Vancouver. And all the solutions that we need are in those forests if we want to look for how to create analogies or metaphors to human habitat. We just have to have the, the humility to go into those systems and ask the right questions. And permaculture gives us the tools to do this. Mm -hmm.